Welcome back to class. I'm your fictional professor, Aaron Johnson, and this is Fictional History 101, a class focused on detailing fictional history. Right now, we're covering Mobile Suit Gundam. In our last class, we talked about Operation V and what this would mean for the Earth Federation's mobile suit development. Today I want to cover the turning point in the One Year War for the Earth Federation, starting with an unintended side effect of Operation V, before we move on to Operation Odessa and some of the early uses of mobile suits in the One Year War. Before we get to that, let's go through a quick recap of where the One Year War was at when Operation V had produced its first prototypes. Xeon had by and large defeated the Earth Federation Space Forces. The only real holdout that the Earth Federation had was Luna 2, which Xeon wasn't able to easily seize. In addition, Xeon controlled the majority of Earth at the time, including California Base, the largest military installation on Earth, and the mineral-rich area of Odessa. The Earth Federation Space Forces and Navy were destroyed, and their army was on the defensive. It was a time that seemed very dire for the Earth Federation. As we mentioned in our last class, development of the Earth Federation mobile suits was taking place on Side 7. When the prototype gun tank, gun cannon, and Gundam mobile suits were nearing completion, the Earth Federation sent their first Pegasus-class carrier, White Base, to retrieve the prototypes. However, while en route to Side 7, White Base encountered a Xeon unit led by Shar Aznabal. The crew received heavy casualties trying to escape from Shara's forces, and arrived at Side 7 with Xeon forces still in pursuit. During the fighting, the captain of White Base, Captain Cassius Palau, would be mortally wounded. While loading the prototype mobile suits onto the White Base, Xeon mobile suits infiltrated the colony. Although they were on a scouting mission, intending to get details on the Earth Federation's mobile suit project, one of the two scouts decided to attack the vulnerable White Base in mobile suits. This would nearly be a disaster for Operation V, as many prototype parts were destroyed, and even more personnel were killed during the attack by the two Zakus. This attack would not only inflict a heavy toll on the mobile suit parts and personnel from White Base, but also cause tremendous collateral damage to the residential areas surrounding the dock, even puncturing the hull of the space colony at one point. During the confusion, Amuro Ray, the son of the head engineer of Operation V, Tem Ray, found the prototype Gundam as it was preparing to be loaded onto White Base. Deciding he needed to take action against the attacking Xeon forces, he climbed into the pilot's seat and activated the Gundam. While he was, at best, a novice pilot, the high-performance Gundam allowed him to defeat both Zakus while taking little damage in return. With the battle subsiding, White Base was able to load one of each prototype on board, as well as refugees from the damaged colony before departing for Earth. Needless to say, the discovery of a Federation mobile suit program, especially one that had produced a suit that could easily defeat two Xeon mobile suits, raised Char's interest. He began to doggedly pursue White Base and its crew. However, however, Char would find the ship more difficult to defeat than anticipated. While the crew was largely made up of inexperienced personnel, such as the acting captain Bright Noah, as well as Side 7 refugees, The superior construction of both the White Base and its surviving mobile suit complement would enable it to fend off Char's attacks, both from Xeon ships and mobile suits. The White Base was able to make it to Earth, with Char's Musai cruiser in hot pursuit. During their attempted re-entry, Char launched a daring attack on White Base, hoping to destroy it as it descended to Earth, or at the very least redirect it. While he was unable to destroy White Base, he was able to force it off course and into North America, This put White Base deep into Xeon-controlled territory, specifically the area held by the youngest Zabi son, Garma Zabi. At this time, Garma was an aspiring captain in the Xeon army. In addition, he was his father's favorite son, and a beloved icon throughout all of Xeon. Unlike the other members of the Zabi family, who tended towards more severe and intimidating appearances, Garma was a soft and delicate man. He was widely admired in Xeon both for his gentle nature and his part in the Dawn Rebellion. However, he wanted to prove himself, both to his family and to Xeon, and was willing to put himself into danger to do so. When Shar Aznable arrived and offered to help him destroy White Base, Garma took the opportunity to gain more recognition. The two of them began to relentlessly attack the White Base, Garma leading the chase with his Gao attack carrier. The Gao attack carrier was an airborne battleship, 
Equipped with mega particle cannons, as well as complements of Zakus and Dop fighters, the Xeon fighter craft. The Gao was, in many ways, a match for the white base. In addition, Garma held a number of mobile suits and other equipment in reserve. The white base crew did its best to hide from the forces Garma had deployed to hunt them, as the prolonged engagements had taken a toll on their supplies, and they were unable to defeat Garma's forces in a direct engagement. On October 4th, while the white base was hiding in a ruined stadium, they were discovered during a scouting mission by Shar. However, when he reported this discovery to Garma, he provided incorrect information on where it was located. When Garma moved his Gao to attack the white base's supposed position, the Federation forces ambushed him. Between the megaparticle cannons and mobile suits of the white base, Garma's Gao sustained critical damage. Knowing there was no escape from the damaged Gao or the advancing white base, Garma took control of the ship and turned it towards the white base. He attempted to dive into the escaping white base, hoping to destroy it with his Gao. However, Garma Zabi died when his Gao crashed, falling short of hitting the escaping Federation ship. After white base's escape, news of Garma's death quickly spread through Zeon. When given the news of Garma's death, Degwin Zabi was shocked. The leader of Zeon dropped his cane and stood in silence. Not long after, he would retreat from public view, falling into a depression as he mourned his favorite son. October 6th, Garma Zabi's funeral was held and televised across Zeon and the Earth Sphere. During the funeral, Gir and Zabi spoke to Zeon, urging them to fight and to avenge the death of Garma Zabi. At this time, Degwin handed control of the Principality of Zeon over to his son, Gir and Zabi. Degwin had begun to lose the will to fight, and had little desire to oversee the war any longer. Not long after this, Zeon's Romba Rawl was sent to Earth in order to continue the pursuit of White Base and the Gundam. Equipped with a Gallup-class land battleship, as well as a prototype mobile suit, the Goof, Romba Rawl's forces harassed the White Base and its crew as they crossed Central Asia. After losing his prototype Guff, as well as several of his pilots, Romba Rawl requested the newly available Dom mobile suits to replace his losses. Unfortunately for him, the local commander Makuve refused his requests for resupply, as he did not wish to draw attention to the mining operations under his command. With no other choice, Romba Rawl launched an attack with his remaining forces, choosing to attack the white base near the Caspian Sea. Rawl's plan was to launch a decoy attack with his Gallup land ship and the remaining Zaku, while he and a small group of soldiers infiltrated the white base during the battle. While successful in boarding the white base, and even capturing the secondary bridge, Rawl's forces would be wiped out by the white base crew. Romba Rawl himself was nearly captured, however he chose to leap out of the white base and attempt to damage the Gundam with a bomb instead. Romba Rawl died during his suicide attack while doing little further damage to the Gundam or White Base. By the end of October, Zeon had lost two prominent figures to the White Base and the Gundam. While Garmazabi's death was the more well-known casualty of the fighting, the loss of Lieutenant Rawl would be a terrible loss for Zeon forces, as he was a skilled pilot and experienced in guerrilla tactics. Something that would be very important for Zeon forces in the coming months of the war. It was at this time that the Gundam began to gain a nickname among Xeon forces, the White Devil. About this time, mobile suits began to see deployment in other theaters of the war. In particular, Southeast Asia saw the deployment of not only GM mobile suits, but also the use of a variant of the RX-79 Gundam that had started to gain its fearsome reputation. This model was the RX-79G Gundam ground type. While not as powerful as the prototype Gundam, this ground-type unit was made from many of the existing prototype parts, and proved to be an extremely dangerous unit on the battlefield. With the White Base and its crew able to repeatedly defeat the Xeon forces set against them, as well as rumors of rising Federation strength, doubt began to rise within Xeon. Xeon prepared several propaganda projects meant to reassure its citizens that the war was still firmly within its grasp. They began to replace their mobile suits with the more advanced DOMs, RIC DOMs, and GUF models, though these would be marginal upgrades compared to the upcoming Federation GMs. In addition, they announced that they would be introducing a new high-performance mobile suit that would outclass the White Devil of the Federation. However, this was little more than a stunt to reassure the public, as the mobile suit was a repurposed model that had been passed over in favor of the Zaku. There was truth that the Federation's strength was on the rise, 
a major counteroffensive was being prepared at the end of October. This offensive was intended to take back mineral-rich mining areas and defeat Xeon forces in a large-scale engagement on Earth. General Revel was set to lead this operation, which would become known as Operation Odessa. Like its namesake, Operation Odessa would take place in the Ukraine. Xeon Colonel Makuve commanded a large mining operation in the area and had a substantial force under his control. Revel planned to attack the mining operations using largely conventional forces, with some mobile suits under his command. Makuve, while having a larger contingent of mobile suits, would be grossly outnumbered by the Federation forces deployed against him. This would mean that he would have to rely on Xeon-built tanks and light attack vehicles, which were markedly inferior to Federation equipment. Prior to the battle, he was able to secure the assistance of a group of Xeon aces, the Black Tristars. Equipped with the recently introduced Dom mobile suit, he hoped that these ace pilots would shore up the outnumbered Xeon defenses. By taking back the area of Odessa, the Federation planned to not only reclaim valuable resources from Xeon, but prevent them from fueling their own war machine. It would also serve as a rallying cry to the beleaguered forces of the Earth Federation. On November 7th, Operation Odessa commenced. General Revel spearheaded the Federation forces attacking Makuve's defensive lines. With their superior numbers and a greater understanding of how to combat mobile suits, the Federation forces were able to pierce Xeon defenses in the area. During the fighting, the Federation used a number of mobile suits for the first time in a major combat operation. This included some prototype RTX-440 gun tanks, as well as the early production run of the GM. This would also serve as the first major engagement for Xeon's newly developed GUF and DOM mobile suits. During the fighting, the Black Tri-Stars encountered the White Base and attempted to destroy it. However, like the pilots that had been set against them previously, however, like the Xeon pilots that had been set against them previously, the Black Tri-Stars were killed attacking the White Base and the Gundam. As the battle looked more and more dire for the defending Xeon forces, Makuve sent a threat to the advancing Federation forces. They would have to stop the attack, or he would retaliate with a nuclear weapon. General Revel told his staff to ignore any such threats from Makuve, and to continue the advance. Although this was at odds with the Antarctic Treaty, which had banned the use of nuclear weapons, Makuve followed through and launched the nuclear missile. This was disarmed by the Gundam, and the attack on Makuve's forces was able to proceed unhindered. Makuve would abandon Odessa and return to space, leaving many of his soldiers behind. Others who fought at Odessa, such as Rear Admiral Yuri Kellerin, would retreat from the area, fleeing towards Southeast Asia and hoping to escape via the Xeon base there. While Xeon was able to secure a great amount of resources prior to their defeat at Odessa, the loss of the mining area, as well as the first major defeat of their forces, was a hard blow for Xeon. Their mobile suits no longer guaranteed success in battle, as they had fielded more mobile suits than the advancing Federation forces and still lost. In addition, the Federation now had mobile suits of their own, several of which had quickly become known as being far more capable than their Xeon counterparts. They'd also lost another major figure, the Black Tristars. It seemed to Xeon that its army was no longer invincible. As I mentioned at the start of this class, there was an unintended side effect to Operation V, the White Base and its Gundam. These served as rallying symbols for the Earth Federation. They were more than just a mobile suit and a new ship. They seemed invincible against the terrifying power of Xeon. Every ace that went up against the White Base was killed, nearly every battle they engaged in a victory. While the White Base suffered losses of its own, nevertheless they still triumphed time and time again. It struck fear into Xeon forces set against them, and the Gundam in particular was feared by Xeon pilots. Xeon began to feel that it had lost the momentum of their earlier successes. Xeon's defeat at Odessa also revealed an uncomfortable truth about Xeon. They were spread incredibly thin. Once defeated at Odessa, Xeon forces across the Earth began to crumble in the face of an organized Earth Federation military, and the Earth Federation's momentum was only building. The string of victories would go on to embolden the Federation, as well as cause panic to begin setting in within Xeon. The two sides would begin to focus on very different goals to finish the war. The Federation began to mobilize and upgrade its military across the board, readying mobile suits and the means to move them to combat areas. Meanwhile, Xeon was focused on coming up with the means of defeating the Federation with incredibly powerful single weapons. 
To this end, they began producing prototypes of a variety of mobile suits and mobile armors, as well as other large-scale weapons meant to either terrify the Federation or to completely overwhelm them. We'll go into this more in another lecture, but it's important to remember this. The Federation took more conservative steps forward, improving its existing technology and introducing quality mobile suit designs, while Xeon under Gear and Zavi's leadership was essentially trying to have a breakthrough as major as their initial introduction of the mobile suit. With the shift in momentum turning towards the Federation, they began to prepare a massive counterattack against Xeon. They quickly defeated much of the organized Xeon forces on Earth, and planned to not only defeat the remaining forces on Earth, but also planned to strike back at Xeon's space assets as well. Rallying its forces at Jabro, the Federation planned to regroup and launch a newly rebuilt and mobile suit-equipped Tiananmen fleet to attack Xeon. By the end of November, White Base had reached the South American base of Jabro. Following closely behind them was Shar Aznable, who discovered a hidden entrance to Jabro from observing the White Base. He signaled the Xeon forces in the area to attack Jabro in the hopes of destroying the Federation headquarters. Xeon forces began to attack Jabro, hoping to defeat the Federation leadership and prevent the launch of their rebuilt fleet. Shar himself was able to infiltrate the base on two occasions with small mobile suit teams, though they failed to destroy the stockpiled mobile suits before they were discovered. Shar was fended off by the pilots of the White Base each time, continuing a long-running feud with the Gundam pilot Amuro Ray. While the attacks on Jabro would damage the sprawling complex, it would not be enough to stall the planned offensive. White Base would leave Jabro at the beginning of December, circling around the moon on its way to Solomon, while the Tiananmen fleet headed directly to Solomon for the start of the Federation's offensive in space. Shar would realize the White Base was serving as a decoy, but opted to chase after White Base, as he had little chance of stopping or outrunning the Tiananmen fleet that was soon to launch from Jabro. With the rebuilt Tiananmen fleet moving to Solomon, the Federation would begin its first major combat operation in space since Loom. Between its mobile suit-equipped fleet and White Base pulling Xeon forces away from the fortress, the stage was set for another bloody battle to begin in the One Year War. The Federation had learned many terrible lessons from the Xeon victories, and had geared their new military to ensure they would not have to learn them a second time. That'll do it for today's lecture. For those of you paying attention, the One Year War started in January, and we've entered mid-December. The war is not far from over, but that's not to say there aren't still terrible battles to be fought. Make sure you read up on Operation Rubicon, as shown in War in the Pocket, as well as the Opsilus Project as depicted in the 8th MS team, as next class will go over some of the last-ditch efforts by Xeon to turn the tide of the One Year War. Take care everyone, and please, don't forget to study. The intro and outro music for this class is Labyrinth by Enrico Altavia, courtesy of freesoundtrackmusic.com. Thank you again for listening to today's class. It's been fun making these, and I'm looking forward to some of the upcoming episodes I have in mind. If you have any comments, please feel free to email me at fictionalhistory101 at gmail.com, or leave a review on iTunes. We're also available on Stitcher and through our WordPress page. Our WordPress page is fictionalhistory101.wordpress.com. Thanks again for listening, and have a nice night.